Okay. Good morning, everyone. How are you this morning? Sure. I must tell you I had a tall order this week. Not only did I only have a week's notice to prepare this message, it was quite a, um, a surprise, and then we had to keep in keeping with brighter the theme, good, better, best, and then we had to include Mother's Day into the, pro, into the program, and then Pastor Larry said, you can speak on anything you want to, like a fence. I said, okay. And then I thought, no, I want to speak on um, covenant, on a covenant and the authority of the name of Jesus. And I, start, and I wrote down my whole message, and I got to the end of the message, and I was like, this is just not working. And so I looked at the notes of offense, and I was like, this is a thick book. <laughs> it's like three series. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a three-part ser- three series message. So I've had to cram a lot of, a lot of information into, into today's teaching. But on days like today, when we face Mother's Day, when we face offenses, when we face so many things, the thing that comes to my mind is a, a picture of the Proverbs woman. And the Proverbs woman, namely, was Bathsheba, and her husband was killed by Uriah, by King David, which is a picture of our typical life today. And the same woman brought up and raised a beautiful son named Solomon. And she enjoyed the privileges and the virtues of doing business and, and being in the, in, the, in the business world without needing the supervision of her husband. She enjoyed his confidences. And I want to say to you today that as women, we can enjoy the privilege and the confidence of being who we are in a good relationship if it is based in Jesus. And so even her family, in spite of her business acquisitions and her her ventures, her family were never neglected. She was always able to to, to shine through. But we see from the beginning of time how the enemy's plan was always to destroy what God meant for good. But God expresses his best when man destroys and breaks what, he has, what God has given us. But what the devil meant for evil, God intends for good. And not only is it God's good, but it's his best to save people. His best is to save people. And in saving people, we have received Christ in our lives and in our hearts, and so it is our job and our responsibility to pass Christ on. The only problem is Satan tries to get in the way, and he gets in the way by means of offense. Matthew 24, 10 says, And many will be offended and will will betray one another because of my name. So what happens is when you start to live a life that is godly and Christ-like, what it will do is it will upset and it will offend the people in the workplace, your colleagues. It will offend your family and your, and, and, and your, your social um, arena because you're making a stand to live a Christ-like life. And the world can't understand that. And so we sit on the fence where excuse the pun, we sit on the fence where we have to make a decision about being godly and living a godly lifestyle or a life unto Christ, not a religious life, a life unto Christ. Or we sit on the side where we have to comply and submit and subject ourselves to what the world expects us to do and the expectation of this world. But Luke 7, 4, uh, Luke seven twenty three. It says, this is in the Amplified Bible, so forgive me because whenever I read the Amplified Bible, I always lose myself. Happy, fortunate, and blessed with life, joy, and satisfaction apart from the outward conditions. And to be envied is he who has no offense in me and who is not hurt. So it specifically tells us that the person who chooses not to take offense or give offense, lives a happy and a blessed life. So it's a commission for us to to try and achieve. What happens is when you're living a life that is Christ-like, 
you offend people. Jesus was the cornerstone, and he said that people would be offended because of me, because of the gospel. And so you don't have to worry about being um, resentful or annoyed or being repelled by people because Jesus, happy will be happy and blessed are the people who will continue in the way of Christ. And so does it surprise us how many people are offended with the way we want to live our lives? And when it's according to Christ's gospels and the decisions that we've got to make that go against the common family and go against our colleagues, here we have to, st- we have to try and aspire or we have to transcend to a higher level of thinking. To, to, to stand and look at offense in its face means you've got to make a choice. And that choice is to take on and transform your mind and your thinking to a higher way. What does that mean? It's quite difficult because when you're caught in that moment, um, you, you see that it's quite a challenge. And so when you're in Christ and you have a relationship with him, the enemy has one plan and that's to trip you up and to trap you. And this is how he does it. He uses the trap of offense, which is, in the Greek, the word scandalon. And this describes a part of the trap that, sets, that, is, set for, that, is, that is set with bait, and, and the bait is attached to the trap. And if the bait is taken, it sets off the trap, and the taker becomes the victim. So here you have your trap with your bait, and as... The, the, the victim starts approaching, and he puts his hand in, the taker is now trapped. The, take, the taker is now the victim. And once entrapped, the victim becomes subject to the intentions of the trapper. And from this, it is clear that offense is the primary bait that Satan uses to entrap believers. And once in this trap, he can easily subject them to anger, to resentment, to criticism, to bring division and rebellion. This, of course, also robs them of their joy and their spiritual usefulness. We must learn to recognize what offense looks like, which is the bait of Satan. Now, I've read all of this to you so that I can set the the platform, because there's two ways that offense works. One is taken and one is given. Now, when one is taken... When, when you're having a conversation with somebody and you take offense, you can actually see that offense will stop the dialogue in its tracks. You can actually see when somebody takes offense. You're like, and you can see in their body language, the body language changes. Then you've got offense that is given. How can you have a conversation with somebody who continually, continually, continually pushes offense onto you? by making a statement, by throwing something out at you, spitting a, spitting a word at you, blocking you. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever had a conversation and somebody goes, oh, really? Oh, is it? Is that what, you, what, are, you, what are you trying to say? You immediately are giving offense. You, you're giving offense to somebody. You're actually provoking somebody into a position that they are now going to be offended. And how can you actually... How can you actually expect a conversation to go on or dialogue to go on or progress to be made when you are so sure of your stance and your position that you think is correct. And what's very interesting that in this realm of offense, this is where our reality is. This is where our sense of dignity and our fairness and our justice reside. This is where it lives, in this area. And so what appears is that we constantly scan and calculate the risk of a possible harm to ourselves and to those we love. Potential offense is, a, is greater than those, potential offense is greater in the area of the people that we love. Also, when we start to think too highly of somebody, it's a very dangerous area. Because what happens is, what happens if I can't continue in the way that you expect me to continue? You are going to be offended. And it's a very unrealistic expectation to con- for me to continue in my performance if you, have, uh, if you have me on a pedestal. 
What if I do something contrary that goes against your expectations? Will you get offended? Are you able to stand back and say, well, that was an unrealistic perspective that I had? Psalm 118 says, it's better to put your confidence in the Lord than in man. And Isaiah 2.22 um, says, stop trusting in man who only has a breath in his nostrils. So many times we put so much emphasis on what people think and what, what's going on around us. And actually our, our trust and our hope needs to be in God. Number two, offense is to disregard someone's sensibilities. To feel or assume to be injured or affronted. I like that word assume. Because assume implies that you're taking on something that's not actually correct or accurate. And so you assume to be affronted or injured. And so you become angry and hostile. Isn't that interesting? You don't actually get cross because there's a real reason to get cross. You get cross because you think or you're assuming that you can do this because it has a power behind it. It has a manipulation about it. And you'll often find that people who manipulate and people who disregard your feelings will take offense in order to take control of the situation and hijack a situation. So offense is to disregard someone's sensibilities and to feel assumed or injured. Number three, to take offense we most likely, we are most likely to assume bad intent more often than not exists. So what it's saying is that we take offense, we assume offense, and it doesn't always exist. It goes back to the, the, the point before, that sometimes the perception of the, of the offense is actually not that real. It also means that another layer of conflict needs to be dismantled before we address the original issue. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody, you're talking to them, and you can see that they've taken offense, but now you've got to address an issue. So that as you're addressing this issue, you're thinking to yourself, I've got to get, I can see their body language, they're offended. How am I actually going to approach this? So you have to now start to dismantle and find a way around their feelings. And again, it comes down to manipulation and control. And so, and then only, can, so all that time is wasted trying to dismantle the actual offense before you get to the real issue. Has anybody had that experience? Do you, are you with me? Sometimes the act of offense without checking the intentions behind it actually gives the offense. So sometimes you, you, um, Sometimes you, you, you automatically, somebody will be talking to you, you automatically go into offense mode and you haven't even checked what the person is trying to say. You've already flown off the handle and you've gone down some rabbit hole and you haven't even checked to see what the person is trying to say to you and there you go, you're in offense mode. You've taken it on yourself. And this slows us down and it, it hampers us. The people who tend to stand on our toes and violate our beliefs and our um, uh, sensibilities are the very people who like to put and give and place offense on, on the other person. The other side of the coin is to make a statement or a phrase like, I don't mean any disrespect, no, inten no, no offense intended. And then they go on to say, but I just want to tell you, I don't like the way this went down. Or I don't like the way that went down. And so offense is given and it's taken, or sometimes it's not taken. And I hope of in more cases they're not, it's not taken. There is no art to not, there is an art to not taking offense. And 1 Peter 1 verse 5 says, be self-controlled. End of story. Do not take offense. Be self-controlled. A practical step in learning not to take offense is to just behave as though nothing went down, go home, and take it to your father in prayer. Because the minute you reveal your position of 
of offence that has been taken or given, you actually expose yourself to the person, and the enemy now has a foot in, and he can run roughshod over you. Some things are blatantly offensive, like cruelty, and those things should be called out on. But you shouldn't take them so personally that it actually destroys your life. And often, number nine, often offense is a position used in a sport ga- in sport to win the game, which talks about strategy. So again, you can see that the enemy's intention to get you to take offense is all part of a strategy to try and throw you off course to get you away from God, and to disrupt your life and your peace. From this it is clear that that Satan's primary bait is to use offense to entrap you and to entrap believers, and he can easily subject you to to anger, resentment, and criticism, bringing division and rebellion. And and, And this, of course, robs us of our joy and our spiritual usefulness. We must learn to recognize offense and not take the bait and learn to deal with it. Now, I needed to just lay that platform down for you because there's three things that specifically happens when offense is taken. And normally, offense comes in the area of leadership. And what happens is rebellion rebellion sets in because that's what it's designed to do. It's designed to get rebellion in. And what is rebellion? Rebellion in the eyes of the Lord is like witchcraft. So if you get yourself into a state of rebellion, you're rebelling against God, and God despises rebellion. So, And we'll go into that just now. And then the second area is um, unforgiveness. It causes you to stay in a place of unforgiveness. And when unforgiveness is in your heart, what usually happens is it manifests in your body. And often, a lot of sickness, mental dis-ease, and and dysfunction comes out of offenses that haven't been dealt with and haven't been worked through. And then, the favorite one. When you bring your tithe to the house of God, make sure that you have laid down your offense. Because what happens is, Well, in the Old Testament specifically, um, there was was an offering that needed to be made before the offering was accepted. And so it was called the trespass offering. You had to make that offering because no other offering is is received and acceptable in the eyes of God unless the trespass offering was made. And so in the New Testament, it talks about Bring your, bring your tithes, bring your tithes to, to, the, to the house of God. But before you do so, go and make right. Go and make a trespass offering with anybody who you have offended or who has offended you so that your house may be blessed because your offering is not blessed. Your tithe is not blessed if you are holding aught in your heart. And that is such a real thing because so many believers are not living in the realm and the area of true prosperity or true promise or fulfilled promise because they're living with so much offense in their hearts. And it is so subtle. It is like cholesterol. It's insidious. You can't see it happening, but slowly, 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 it's sitting on your heart and restricting your movements. And as it restricts your movements, your life is restricted. What happens is you start drawing back. You become less useful. You stop, you stop serving in the house of God. You stop being motivated to do things that, that, that create a positive atmosphere around you. You become less inspired, demotivated, because you have taken hold of a fence. You've, it's rooted and it's, taken, it's, it's created a stronghold in your life, and you don't know how to get past it. And so what happens is we start seeing with the eyes of negativity. We start hearing with the ears of negativity and, and offense and defilement. Every, to him who is defiled, everything is defiled. So when you are looking through a lens of offense, know that everything is tainted with the offense that's in your heart. So you can never see anything from a pure and a true perspective. And you've got to take your truth 
and you've got to apply it to, with, you've got to look at God's truth. And sometimes they are way off the mark with each other. Your, your truth, your reality needs to match up with God's reality. And it's work. It's work, it's effort. So I want to talk about a couple of people in the Bible who, um, who were really, really very useful but had to overcome offense so that they could be useful to God. And one of them was Joseph. Joseph had numerous occasions to be offended. He could be offended with his brothers who threw him into the pit. He could be offended with Potiphar's wife who tried to seduce him and throw him into prison. And then he had to work his way out of prison. Then he was... Um, uh, the, the cupbearer tried to poison him. There were so many opportunities for him to be offended, but he somehow managed to transform his mind and his thinking and rise above that so that God could continue to use him in every area of his life. And it's the same with us. We've got to try and find a way to transform our thinking, which is down here, to our thinking, which is up here with God. Because God's ways are higher. And if we can just aspire to how God thinks, his grace is sufficient for, for us. His grace is enough for the day to get us through today. Don't worry about tomorrow and how tomorrow is going to play itself out. And don't lie in bed and be the judge and be the jury and wake up in the morning and you've vindicated yourself, you've ruled, you've ruled the judge, and the whole night you've spent tossing and turning because you, you're, tossing, you're turning the, 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 the case over in your mind and you're turning the case over in your mind and you wake up in the morning, you're no better off. Because what can you do? How much worry can you apply to the situation that God can't actually undertake and change for you? So it's very important to know, you know, what God, what, what the enemy intended for evil, God intended for good. I said in the beginning that man has a way of, of breaking what God, God intended for good. And only when we have broken what God's good for us was, are we able to now resign ourselves to the fact that we actually are not able because the minute we break something or the minute we um, go into an area that has destroyed our lives, the enemy has got in. And only God can come in after that and transform and save. And that's God's best, saving, saving us, helping us. Amen? Amen. Has, has anybody been saved from a situation where they actually thought, I don't know what I would have done if it wasn't for God? I want to tell you about an experience that I had. I was, um, <laughs> I was a bit off the track serving God, about this much. <laughs> I'd just come out of the wilderness, okay, and I was just starting to serve the Lord and to love the Lord. And I just remember I was sitting watching TV one Sunday night. I was living on my own. It was before I met Pastor Larry, and I was living on my own. It was a Sunday night, and it was winter, and... I wanted to go to church that night, and remember Pop Idols, American Pop Idols had just, just come out, so it was like the rage, everybody was watching Pop Idols. Okay, I'm showing my age now. But anyway, and so I'm watching Pop Idols, and I'm sitting on the edge of my chair, I'm ready to get dressed, and I'm like, I'm just going to watch this one more song. And then that song goes past, and I get to the door, and I'm just going to watch it, and I've got the remote, and I'm just going to watch it. And I'm like, I've still got five minutes, I can make it, and I'll just be ready to miss the praise and worship. How many people miss praise and worship over here? Hmm? I'll just miss the praise and worship. Anyway, I love the praise and worship. I can have praise and worship and then go home and not even worry about the message, which is not great. <laughs> but I'm just saying, I prefer the music. I love the music. So now, by the time I've missed the worship, I'm thinking to myself, oh, it's a waste of time to go to church now. I haven't got the, oh man. And so I start getting cross and I start getting irritated and I'm like, you know, I wish God would take responsibility for himself because now he's made me feel bad because I don't go to church because of the sin in this world and I go off the rails. <laughs> because of the sin in this world, now I'm expected to go to church and get my life right when it could have just been right from the beginning. I'm like, 
<laughs> what a stupid argument. Anyway, but I was, what happens is, when you take offense, or when you get into a state of offense, it actually exposes what's really inside your heart. So think about it before you get all huffy and offended and froth at the mouth. Because it actually shows where you are actually at as a, as a person. And that's where the transformation or the transcending of your attitude and the way you live and who you are needs to change and develop to a higher level. And so what happened was I didn't go to church. I was fuming. I went to bed at cross with God. But it actually just showed where I was because I wanted to get to church, but I gave into my flesh. And now I was cross and I needed somebody to blame. Anyway, God is God and I am not. So what happens is the next morning, I'm, I used to live in close to Bryanston, and so I'm driving down Cumberland Road. I turn out of one of the side roads into Cumberland Road, and it's a big bendy road. And before I know it, from I don't know where, this truck, this four-trailer truck, comes flying down the road. God alone knows how I landed on the pavement. But I landed on the pavement, and I sat there, and I was like, oh, Thank you. And I just thought, I, I, I felt I heard the Holy Spirit say, you know what? I am God and you are not. I have the last say. I have the power and the ability to take you out. I, I put the, the breath in your nostrils. Don't look to man. Don't look to the people and the circumstances. Keep your eyes focused on me. Because man, will, man will, is subject to the enemy subject to his feelings and her feelings. And his feelings and her feelings are not righteous all the time because there is nothing righteous in us but Jesus. And so what happens is when we subject ourselves to other people and their will and their emotions, we allow ourselves to be offended, to take offense and to give offense. When you give offense, you become a stumbling block to somebody else's walk. And when you become a stumbling block to somebody else's walk, you are responsible for God, before God for that. So it's time that the church starts realizing, the church and people and everybody, that we start realizing that our role in life is to stay focused on our relationship with God because the enemy's plan is to sabotage, to destroy to break you down and to throw you out. And so Moses spent, his, spent 40 years in the desert trying to get over his offense. He spent another, I don't know how many years, trying to, uh, sorry, he, he, he ran off to the desert because he was offended by the way the Israelites were treated. And so he killed an Israelite and then he was exiled to the desert. Spent 40 years in the desert trying to get over that offense, which actually prepared him for the offense of the Israelites that murmured against God in the desert. And then he still got offended, struck the rock, and he didn't see heaven. I mean, he didn't see um, the promised land. Can you see three times how easy offense can get to you? And then we've got um, Job, who we know that that was just a refining process that he just went through all the time because he, he realized that he had to now... Get, take his thinking from here to here, from here to here, so that he could continually um, move out of the areas of offense and, and, and lack of um, applying God's word. In one of the parts of Job, in Job 23, I think he says, God, he shouts at God and God says to him, stop telling me what to do. Start applying what I've told you to do, which you are telling all of your friends. In other words, stop telling everybody else what to do and start applying the word of God to your own life. When are you applying the word of God to your own life? Are you applying the word of God to your own life? Because if you were applying God to, your, to every area of your life, you would be focused. You would be directional. You would be positive. Yes, the enemy would try and come in and, and sabotage you, but what happens is... Um, God, God's grace is sufficient for the day. God will save you if your heart is right. And then we've got the story of Absalom. Absalom was a future potential king with so much going for him. What happened was 
Amnon, his brother, raped his sister, and he was very offended. He was so offended with King David because King David didn't take the right action. He didn't take the right action and apply it to the situation, and so Absalom got offended. And so he just, what, what that caused was rebellion in his heart. And when, he, when this rebellion stirred up in his heart, he was forced, to, he, he was exiled. But then the king allowed him to come back. And what happened was, in, in his return, he was under the, the king's supervision. Who, who knows who the king was? It was King David. Under King David's super, supervision, what Absalom did was he caused division. And that's what offense is designed to do. It's designed to cause division. It says in, um, in Samuel 13, 1 Samuel 13, it says that he caused division. What did he do? He stole the hearts of the people. He got them aside and he said, da 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 da, da and, he, and he whispered in their ears and he, he got them on his side and he carried favor with them. And when the time was right, he tried to take over. And so what happened in the end is he lost his calling. He lost everything that he had, and then he died. So he didn't even get to rule in the office. And that's what rebellion does. It's, it's meant to break down and cause division, create a split. When that rebellion sets in, not only does it create a split, split but what happens is, this is a very difficult message because all the words are big, <laughs> to create a split. And then what happens is, because the leader didn't take the right um, form of action against the crime, Absalom was upset. And so he wanted to take authority into his own hands. And so many times a leader or a or person that's in charge or somebody that you look up to doesn't display the right action or take the right action for a situation, and it upsets you. And so what you do is you get upset you walk out, you throw your tantrum, then you come back, but there's division. Division is already set in. And when division sets in, nothing in that person's eyes that that leader can do can ever be positive. It's filtered through the eyes of negativity because that person has fallen from grace in your eyes, and anything and everything that they can ever do starts off on the basis of you're either political or you're self-motivated. How many people struggle with a leader or, or somebody in their lives that they look up to that is, that it, where, where something has gone wrong and they haven't taken the right action? How easy is it for you to get offended? We do it all the time. The thing is, we carry it over. We, we wrestle through it through the night and we become the lawyer. And by the next morning, we've judged this person. What's supposed to happen is we're supposed to take it to God. And we're supposed, we're supposed to say, Lord, how do you expect me to deal with this? In fact, if I trust God the way I say I do, and if I trust God the way he expects me to, I would be able to leave it at his feet and allow him to vindicate me and to change the situation. But we don't trust God. We trust in the power of our own strength. And our own strength is motivated by our own selfish need always motivated by our own selfish need. And so I motivate you to take, take a look and see how many times when people fall, what's happening in their lives just before they fall. The move of God is moving, is taking place. Something is happening. Blessing is flowing. God is working in their lives. Um, there's favor wherever they go. Their children are blessed. Their work is blessed. Things are happening. Doors are opening. And then what happens? The enemy comes in and he rolls the ball of offense and it knocks you out. Now, either you get knocked out or you stand up and you say, Father God, I, in your strength, I have the ability to get up and overcome this. You have to, have to be aware that the enemy is so sharp. And so what happens is, when you're in that place um, of, of prosperity and, and, and you're doing well, and the enemy comes to take you out, if you succumb to that, what happens is you lose your calling, you lose your joy, you lose your position. And it's just a matter of time thereafter where the decay sets in. 
And if you, and, and so what happens is that they stop serving. They stop loving God because they're offended at God because God is great. He should have done something. But you must remember this. God can never go against a person's will. That's why he gave us the freedom of choice. He can never, ever, his hands are tied as long as you are in control. He cannot work in the situation. And so what you need to do is you need to give it over to God and you need to say, Lord, you know what? If you leave this to me, I know how I'm going to handle this. <laughs> if you leave it to me, I know I'm going to, I'm going to bring out my bazooka. <laughs> It's going to be over. And then I can have this planet to myself. But the outcome of that is not great anyway, because who am I going to spend, it, spend my life with? You're going to have destroyed everything in your life. You're going to have blasted it out of orbit. So you have to leave it for, to God, because God is greater, God is bigger, and he's able to help you to work through what you need to work through. The next part of offense is the part where you've created rebellion, you are now in a rebellious state, and your finances aren't flowing because you haven't forgiven, you haven't overcome, um, or you haven't released forgiveness towards somebody, or you're still harboring some offense in your heart about something. And so God can't bless your finances. He can't bless your life. The enemy has come in. The next step is sickness. Your mind and your thinking are contaminated, and you're sick you're sick with pain, you've got a headache, you're depressed, you don't really, you can't think straight. Where there is chaos and confusion, there is every, where there's chaos and confusion, there is every, where there's chaos and confusion, there's every, evil work. God, the enemy wants to cause chaos and confusion. And when you are confused, you can't make a decision. When you are confused, you can't think straight, and you affect the company and the people around you. Have you ever walked into a room and, and, and everything's fine, and then somebody walks in and the whole atmosphere changes? Because there's a person who's offended in the room, and you can feel it. You can cut it with a knife. It affects, it, it affects your well-being. It affects your stability. It affects your creativity. It affects the flow of God, and it obstructs the flow of God in your life. And so you have to come to a place that, where you realize that where, where, where you are forgiven, forgiveness flows. When you can't forgive, and forgiveness can't, uh, for, forgiveness can't flow, and God's work is hampered and, and stilted, and your life is put on hold. Forgiveness is such a hard thing. Not because the act of forgiveness is hard. Because we have a sense where we feel that you owe me. I'm entitled to your certain behavior or your certain action due to what you have done, due to what you are doing, or due to how you've conducted or behaved yourself. You can't, you can't think like that. Forgiveness is a divine act of God. It cannot be revoked. When you forgive somebody, you are released and God releases you. God re how dare we not forgive somebody? Because look what God did for us. Just to get us into the kingdom, that's God's best. He forgave us, and because he forgave us, we forgive others, and our job is to get them saved so, that they can, so we can perpetuate the cycle. That is the purpose, that is the point. The minute, God can get you, um, the minute Satan can get you to a place where you're not forgiving and you're not serving him, because when you're in a state of unforgiveness, you cannot serve God wholeheartedly. And how do we serve God wholeheartedly? With our worship. Stand in church and look at how many people cannot lift up their arms and open up their arms wide. And, I, and I'm not being critical. I'm, I'm expressing a point here. People who are struggling with unforgiveness stand closed. Their hearts are closed. Their composure is closed. They have shut themselves off because they do not want to let anything in. And you can't move forward in God and in life if you're going to hold unforgiveness in your heart. It's going to hamper you. It's going to slow you down. It's going to stop you from being productive. You're going to become unuseful. And it's a matter of time. Mark it in your diary today. The day you took offense, look back and see, that's when I took offense. Where am I today? 
I'm actually not as productive as I was when I was at that point before I got offended. So reevaluate your circumstance. Reevaluate what's going on. And then, before you come and judge me, take the splinter out of your own eye. Stop looking at me because of what I've done and start looking at yourselves, ourselves. We've got to do this with each other. Take what is in your own eye out. Go to God and repent and cleanse your heart before him. You know, authorities and, and um, people in our lives have broken us and let us down. And we've, we're walking in forgiveness and we're walking in hurt and we're walking in pain and we're not produ productive and we're not prosperous because we're not living in our promised land because we've subjected ourselves to the anger and the hurt that they have caused us. And we, we're struggling to surrender it. And I can tell you right now, if you're able to surrender whatever it is that God has done, that the enemy has done to you, and it's not easy. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that have done a lot of wrong to me that have caused me to stumble and caused and hampered my development and progress, not even by what they've done, just by what they've said. How many people have said something to you that you're holding on to, that you're not able to move past because I'm just not good enough anymore? This is how they think of me, or this is, what this is how they feel about me. It's the perception of what they're thinking and what they're feeling that is actually keeping you captive in the cage. It's like the monkey in the cage. It's like the monkey he puts his hands through the cage and he picks up the stick. And the stick has got sweetness on it and he wants to eat the sweet, but he can't because he won't open his fist and let the stick go and maybe manip and let, let it work its way out another way. We hold on to that stick. Drop the stick. Drop the stick. Drop the offense so that God can do what he needs to do. He will, he'll see to it and he'll find a way that you get the sweetness that you deserve. He'll find a way. And so right now, in this atmosphere of serenity and, and peace. And I, I just want to say to you that you need to find your peace. God has given you a spirit of peace and of truth and of love and of a sound mind. Be self-controlled. Take authority over that, that offense and the enemy's attempt to try and sidetrack you and, 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 and um, ball you out of the game. And if you just close your eyes for a minute... Ask yourself, who have I given offense to? Who have I given offense to? From whom have I taken offense? Just think for a moment. And at this point, even though you don't know how you're going to do it, just surrender it to God. So, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to let this go. I don't know how I'm going to surrender it to you. But I'm taking an act of faith. I'm making an act of faith. I'm taking a step of faith here. And I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm surrendering the offense that has been done to me, that has been given to me, I'm surrendering the offenses that I've taken so that I can walk, Father God, that I can progress in life and so that I can fulfill the call of God in my life. And as you're thinking about that, I just want you to, to just stand. Let's just stand. I just want you to just take this minute and just be quiet and let God speak to you. Allow him to speak to you just for a minute. And if there's anybody who's really, really struggling with an offense today, given or taken, to release, I just want you to raise your hand so that I can pray for you. All of us have been offended. There's not one of us that haven't been offended. But if there's one of you that are finding it difficult to move your lives forward, just lift your hand so that as a point of contact and under the corporate anointing, we can ask God 
we know that God can do the impossible. Father, we thank you today that as we surrender to you, Father God, whatever is in our hearts, whatever is lodged in our hearts like shrapnel, Father God, causing the blood not to flow anymore, we just ask you, Heavenly Father, to forgive us. The way you forgave us, Father God, allow us to forgive those who have hurt us. We surrender our hurt. We surrender our pain. We surrender that, Father God, which we don't have control over. And we ask you to intervene. Holy Spirit, we ask you to intervene. And I just pray over this congregation at the moment. And anybody who's struggling, I just thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit that breaks the shackles of bondage, that breaks hurt, that breaks pain, that heals and soothes pain. Lord, you are our balm. You are the balm of Gilead, Father God. Your word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you will never let us down. You will never let us down. Amen.